Yeah. Hello and welcome to Deep Discovery 2017. My name is Amber um, and this is my colleague Adrian. Hi. And we are both from the Natural History Museum in London, so quite a long way from where you guys are going to be coming from today in Cornwall and a few of you I think from around Plymouth in Devon. So we're here today on a boat called the RV Callista um, and that stands for Research Vessel Callista because this is where we do all of our sampling of the amazing marine life that lives in our waters around Cornwall and all of the southwest and where we are here in Plymouth and Devon today. There is some beautiful marine life that lives here with an extreme diversity which means lots of different types. Um, we've got things called jewel anemones that are really bright and are fluorescent. We have big spider crabs we have, um, that we'll have a video to show you of later. Um, and in order for us to be able to look at these animals, because we can't get down very easily um, with being a, a, unless we do diving, and that can be quite expensive and quite difficult, we have almost a little pet robot who we call Rex. And Adrian's going to tell you a little bit about Rex, and you'll be able to meet him today, our little underwater robot. Yeah, thanks Amber, and yeah, welcome. It's wonderful you can join us. It's a lovely day here in Plymouth Sound. Uh, and as Amber said, so how, how do you see what lives at the bottom of the ocean? It's really, really hard to do that because if you just look out to see, you can't see through it. It's almost like it's completely opaque. A glass of water you can see through, uh, but actually when you get to several metres of water, it's really, really hard to see the seafloor. But fortunately, we have our amazing robot submarine Rex. My colleague John from the University of Southampton is holding up Rex. Rex is a robot uh, that we control from the surface has a camera here uh, that we can pan up and down and see things in the water and an amazing high definition camera a really good camera down here it was very expensive uh, that we're very pleased with that we put there we have a little arm we can pick things up on the seabed and we have lights here uh, at the top we have some systems that allow us to actually see where rex is on the seafloor a little thruster for do up and down so it's like a little propeller and at the back here you can see it's actually switched on so very important i don't put my fingers into the propellers just in case they suddenly start spinning uh, we have propellers to go forwards and backwards and then this is a really really important part uh, because of course we don't let rex off on his own he will disappear off and be swept away by the currents he's always attached by this long tether a bit like a, a vacuum cleaner before they invented the ones without cords uh, so it's a bit like that so part of launching rex and Organising Rex is to organising the tether and John is going to demonstrate. We are now going to launch Rex uh, into Plymouth Sound. We're here in the beautiful Mayflower Marina. Bye Rex! Bye Rex, good <laughs> luck on your voyage of discovery. <laughs> Hopefully this is not the last time that we see you. John is now going to go inside the control room and actually control Rex. Uh, we should see the thrusters powering up. We give him a little bit of cable, that's probably enough. So Rex is now sitting on the surface and he's off. Okay, so John is now navigating. Oh, I can see some fish down there. The lights are on. I think Rex can see them too. Fantastic. So that's Rex deployed. So we're going to now go into the uh, control room. So if you follow me, we've got Gary here who's filming us brilliantly from the University of Southampton uh, boat group. Uh, why don't you go in there? And we'll, we'll go straight now into the... We were on a 20 metre long research boat. So we're at, that was the back deck where we launched things. This is the lab where we look at amazing specimens underwater. We'll show you some of those in a minute. And this is my favorite room. This is the Rex control room. And here, John, uh, my colleague from the University of Southampton, he's flying and suddenly we just launched. So you can see here, perhaps Sir Gary, if you come, if I get out, if I go down, you can see what's going on. But as you get over the shoulder of John, he's actually up against the uh, wall. Uh, we're just looking at, so he's controlling the ROV with these, uh, little joystick down here it's a little bit like a computer game uh, you can uh, uh, effectively move the, the ROV around in three dimensions we've got instruments here that show John where he is which direction he's headed uh, we've got uh, a navigation system which is not actually switched on oh that's because we have a little problem but that's okay don't worry about that we know where we are because we're at the surface at the moment uh, and uh, so this this is Rex an amazing facility and I think Amber uh, we're going to like go through some of the amazing things that we found uh, with Rex just recently, just off the coast here, off the coast of Plymouth, uh, one of the most beautiful bits of coastline and underwater, really one of the most species-rich, the most biodiverse, the word that we use for the numbers of species areas of the UK coast. 
Yeah, so if we just pan up to this screen behind us here, our Gary, our lovely cameraman, um, the first thing is what you're going to be seeing here are the beautiful coral reefs that grow in our deeper waters. So they're called cold water corals. And I know a lot of you might be quite surprised that we have coral reefs in the UK waters because usually we see them in tropical, hot environments. But we do have these beautiful corals here and they're beautifully colourful. And they make these big reef habitats that have lots of other animals living in them. For example, you can see all the branches of this beautiful sea fan here and baby fish, which we call juvenile fish, will live in between these branches and it means that they can hide from the big nasty predators that are um, trying to eat them. And this is really important for the fish, not only so that they stay alive, but also because these are the fish that we eat for our dinner and without these coral reefs we might not be able to have fish for our dinner. So what you're going to be watching next is some footage where you can see Rex turning his lights on and off. Um, and it's really important that Rex has lights because in the deep sea, so uh, maybe from 20 metres to 40 metres that we're looking at here. There, they, Amber? Yeah. yeah, so what you'll notice is when the lights go off, everything goes blue. And that's because when light waves travel in to the deeper sea, the first type of light that disappears is the colour red. And so that's why when he turns his light off, it's all blue. And then when he turns it on, you can see all the beautiful bright red colours. Um, so that is called, for those of you who want to know, light attenuation, when the light is absorbed in our water differently to how it is in air. These are absolutely beautiful, these ones, and they are called jewel anemones because they shine like jewels. And you can't see it so much here, but in a minute, when we get closer to them, you can see that they have fluorescence, which means they have really bright colours um, that you can see here. Jewel anemones have up to a hundred of these tiny little tentacles that you can see on each anemone here. And this is what they use. You might be able to see some tiny bits of what almost looks like snow going past the screen. And the snow is called marine snow and it's particles of food that they eat. Amber, might just interrupt you there. Oh, what have John, you found? We've just, we're just up here and we found some beautiful mussel shells growing. So this is just to see from, we're actually live now looking with the camera. It's a little bit overexposed. I'm just going to uh, switch your exposure yeah. compensation on. That should bring down... That sounded very technical. That was technical, yeah. <laughs> That sometimes just helps bringing in... Uh, oh, those colours look lovely now. Chilly rock. Mm -hmm. And then we'll do a bit of wide. And I've lost your focus there, so I'm just focusing the camera a little bit. And hopefully we're going to bring out... There we go. Coming into focus. Some mussel shells, yeah. So there we go. There we are. So what, do you explain what those are, John? Yeah, so these are mussels you might get in the restaurant or see in the supermarket. And here they're living just on the underside of the pontoon where we're, where we're parked up uh, uh, with the boat. Uh, and as you can see, they're, they're thriving. And there's lots of other marine life living around them and they're amongst all this weed and there's some sponge in there as well. And some other tiny little animals, polyp-like animals called hydroids in there too, from the look of it. And that's just underneath the surface where there's still lots of light, lots of colour. Fantastic, yeah, and I think Amber's now got something pretty cool to show you. We filmed just a couple of kilometres just offshore, so should we go back to the... You there, Amber? Yes, Great. I am. And I shall... We just recorded this um, just beyond the, the Plymouth Breakwater. So you're still looking at the jewel and enemies at the minute, and um, I'll just tell you a little bit about these. These are the polyps of the coral that you saw just now, and it shows how amazing Rex's camera is in HD, so high definition. You can even count all the tiny tentacles on the corals. So this is the bit Adrian was just talking about, really exciting, so we're building the suspense here. If you keep watching, you're going to see something pretty special. Wow. So this is actually a type of shark that we find in UK waters, and people are usually surprised when they hear that you can find sharks swimming this close to us, but actually none of them are dangerous, you don't need to worry. The biggest one that we find in UK waters is called the basking shark, and they can be like two, three metres big. And they have a really big mouth, but they have no teeth. Um, so they just suck in plankton, and that's how they feed. So you don't need Ooh. to worry about that. 
And then this is absolutely <laughs> beautiful. So this is a spider crab and it's a spiny spider crab because you can see all his spikes on what is called his carapace. Yep, like... Which is Where are his part. eyes? Are those the eyes? His eyes are on green. little stalks either yeah. side of these spikes. Yeah. Yep. Those are the eyes. Here's his mouth. He's currently waving He's at feeding. us. He's feeding. And you can see tiny little bits called mouth parts here and that's how he filters out all of this marine snow that's in the water around him. And he also grows algae and hydroids, which is why he looks fluffy. Um, they grow on him like seaweed oh, grows on rocks. Wow. What's that, Amber? These are called light bulb sea squirts um, because they look like <laughs> tiny little light bulbs and they're very, very bizarre animals. And then finally, this was really exciting because this animal is really, really rare. It's called a spiny lobster. And if you keep watching, the, you'll see look at him, the antennae. Yeah, they're really absolutely really long huge. antennae. So his antennae are actually even bigger than he is, which is amazing. He just swam away from us there, but don't worry, we're going to find him again. And they're really rare because there was a lot of what we call overfishing, so a bit too much fishing in the 1970s. And because we caught too many of them, the population, so the number of the lobsters, decreased a lot. But now we have what are called marine conservation zones or marine protected areas. And these have really shown that they're allowing, just in the past few years, for their numbers to increase again. So that's a really happy story of how protecting animals and us doing sampling like this can be a good story and can um, save a lot of marine animals. So we're just going to pan back over this way a minute because we've had a lot of questions, questions coming in from you all. So our first question got in very early. And it was from Treviglas Community College, which is actually my old school. So hello, everyone. I think a lot of the teachers there used to teach me. I'm sorry if I was awful. Um, and the first question is actually from Miss Penrose, um, who used to teach me. And it says, how do deep sea creatures adapt to conditions with no light? For example, especially organisms that live in the real deep sea, for example, at hydrothermal vents, these big, dark underwater um, chimneys, because um, they can't use photosynthesis. So this is actually something that we study a lot. And when there's no light in the ocean, as Miss Penrose says, the animals that live in this darkness can't use photosynthesis. So they do one of two things. The first thing they can do is, if you remember the marine snow, all the particles we were talking about earlier, they fall down thousands of metres all the way down to even 11 kilometres. So that's 11,000 metres below the sea surface. And when these particles fall down to the bottom, the animals that live on the sand and the mud at the bottom will eat these particles because they have no sunlight, so there's no plants there that can make the food for them. The second thing that they can do is something called chemosynthesis, which is similar to photosynthesis. So photo means light and synthesis is to make. Well, chemosynthesis is where they use chemicals in the water that's coming out of the ground, like you get in hot springs and um, geysers that um, fire out of the ground on land, and they use the chemicals that are found in these in order to make energy because they don't have light. So it's really, really amazing because, for example, if the sun blew up tomorrow, which I really hope it doesn't, um, these hydrothermal vents with chemosynthetic animals um, they would continue to be able to exist, mm. which is why they're really, really incredible. It's an amazing place. I should just add, we're actually in the same room as John Copley, who has dived <laughs> to the world's deepest hydrothermal <laughs> vent in the Caribbean Sea, or well, the Cayman Trough. An incredible place. And um, yeah, John, do you want to say a couple of words about uh, you know your experiences of diving to 5,000 metres? Yeah, because you didn't actually dive in scuba no, gear, did no. you? No, that, that kind of thing is too deep for scuba diving, but we can use machines like Rex, but we there are also a few very special craft in the world that can carry people um, that deep. And so four years ago, I was lucky to uh, to take a ride in one of them and go three miles down, 5,000 meters, to the world's deepest undersea hot vents uh, in the Cayman Trough, where we found quite a lot of new species of animals, new species of shrimp, new species of fish, new species of snails, that all, to them, that's, that's normal, that's where they live, uh, and they're used to the conditions down there. Uh, so it's amazing to be able to visit these places uh, and to have the technology to do that.
Great, thank you, John. No, that's great. Well, I think, Amber, have you got some uh, some shout outs or some questions or things here? Yep, so our next shout out will be uh, for St Stephen's School in Saltash. So, hello, everyone. Hello, St Stephen's. They've sent us a lot of questions through, Adrian. Okay, right, so I'm, be ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Um, so, the first question I'm going to give to you How does Rex go into the sea when he has a lot of electric wires on? Because obviously, they good must question. be learning about electric at the moment. Good it's question. dangerous to have it in the water. It's, that's a really good question. It's really difficult to mix electronics, things that have electrical power in them, with the sea. The sea is uh, always is, it's very salty and it's wet and it really messes around with electronics so it's really challenging everything has to be sealed so that that long yellow cable that you saw coming out is really thick and really sealed inside it are uh, very thin wires most of it is just a, the shielding the protection for those wires and then rex itself is sealed really well obviously we have those clear bubbles on the front and the back to be able to see in there for the cameras to be able to see out uh, but really it's just sealed very very well using o-rings and everything so there's no water getting inside although that does occasionally happen uh, so you do have to be prepared for that um, but there are, there are some things you can do to, to rescue the situation if you do get water in there so really good question okay thanks adrian so our next question we've got a lot about rex people seem to like oh, them yeah, a lot yeah. Well, we like, everyone loves Rex. Everyone loves Rex. Oh, have you told people what Rex stands for yet? Oh, no. So Rex is the... So the R is, is the R from remotely operated and then vehicle for education with a big E and exploration with a small E and a big X. So that's where we get Rex from. OK, and the next question is... Has Rex ever stopped working? I'm going to sit down here. So uh, you've been on. That's all right. Well, yeah. not quite Adrian, similar. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm Adrian is twice as tall as me, so this yeah. is um, quite has hilarious. Rex, yeah. <laughs> has, Rex, has Rex ever stopped working? Good question. Uh, several times. Uh, in fact, uh, there's always little problems. Little things go on and off. Uh, even just this morning, we were, we were struggling with bits and bobs because there's lots of things that are connected together. And when you have lots of connections, there's always some connections which go wrong. Uh, and a couple of times we've actually got Rex entangled on the seafloor. But of course, Rex, yeah, so it was, it, was fright, it was a little bit scary. But of course, you remember, Rex is just a piece of equipment. Uh, we're not putting humans down there, so you can be a little bit more uh, relaxed about those sorts of things. In that case, we actually just Rex, we left Rex overnight, uh, came back the next day with a couple of divers who helped recover Rex for us. Uh, so there are things like that, that you can do. Um, and that's one of the beauties of really working with remotely operated vehicles is this it's much less dangerous really for us so we don't have to send people down all the time uh, and uh, we can we can do slightly more adventurous things uh, even at the risk of occasionally losing losing Rex so yeah no good question yeah really good question I imagine it would have been slightly more scary if it had been the bigger version of Rex that John was in at the time oh, so that's, that's right. the good thing yeah. is that we yeah. don't have to sacrifice John for science which yeah. is always a good thing yeah no, he wouldn't like, he probably wouldn't like he's that. quite clever and yeah. he does a lot of good things so we don't really want to sacrifice him to the sea <laughs> um, so the next one is do we have a backup robot if Rex stops working well, we actually don't, uh, so that's why we have to be pretty careful with no, Rex. No, we have to be careful. I mean, uh, if you're going out on a boat for m many weeks at a time, you'd probably need to have backup systems to be able to, to deal with one thing going down. So when Amber and myself and John and the others, we go out for a month sometimes to the sea on a big boat, then we have lots and lots of different pieces of equipment. So if one's not working, then we have something else that we can do. I think we've got some more questions. We have. So um, we better go through. Oh, just going to address a couple here. How dark is the water and why is it so dark? So I hope maybe I answered that question a little bit earlier when I was talking about what was called light attenuation. So because the water is what you call maybe, you know, it's a bit denser than the air around you, which is why, you know, if you try and wave your arms like this in the air, it's very easy. But when you push your arms through the water, it feels thicker. Um, and that's because it's more dense. And because it's more dense, it's very difficult for the light waves coming from the sun to get through the water so they kind of get absorbed like like the sea's like a big sponge for light and so by the time you get down to a thousand meters you don't really have any light so that's why the sea is really dark so the sea gets a little bit more dark as you get down to a thousand meters and then it all goes pretty much um, and you've got no light beyond that point so that's when animals have to start getting clever and adapt to clever ways of eating um, when there's no light around and that was actually, oh, we've got the name of the person who asked that one. That was Kieran from St. Stephen's Saltash. So hello, Kieran. Good question. Excellent. And then I think our final question at the moment from the first set of questions from Saltash was, um, are there any seahorses in Plymouth Sound? And that's from Mrs. Arthur. Mm, good question for you, Amber. Yes. So have, we seen any, have we seen any seahorses? I haven't seen any around sure here, but here, I though. think they are here because you get 
The only plant that grows in the sea is called Zostera marina, and oh, that's its yeah. fancy Latin name. And it's called sea grass, and it looks exactly like grass, but it grows in the waters all around Cornwall and all around the southwest and abroad as well in hotter countries. And the seahorses like to live in here, and they're very, very rare. And we do find them in these waters, but we haven't seen them with wrecks yet, so no, we're holding we out hope. Look. We could actually go to some seagrass beds and have a look. That's so a great idea. So you've given us an idea, yeah, Mrs. Arthur. That's should, where yeah. we'll be going next. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so should we go and have a look in the lab? Or yes, I think uh, we should, and we'll yeah, do a bit more questions later. And then we take some more questions. Yeah. There's some more coming in, Thank so you very I'll much. hand those to you, Amber. So we're just uh, going to go out on deck. Oh, we've got to go out on deck. Yeah. Yes. yes. So I was going to explain a little bit about some of the research that we've been doing, uh, some of the actual science that we've been conducting oh, with Rex yeah. and with this amazing boat, the Callista. Uh, and I think out here. Uh, we have some activity. Uh, let's see what's happening. Um, goodness me, so we've got uh, over here uh, my colleagues Helena and uh, Midori are sieving uh, some mud from the seafloor. So just in this sieve there are little animals that we brought up uh, from the sea just out, just beyond, just right here and Helena is now sieving those using this very fine sieve. You can see that up here there's a tiny, tiny little hole and we've actually tried to collect the really small animals that live there and I'm going to show you some of those in the lab in a minute. So we put mud into that sieve, we washed it with seawater uh, and we're collecting those animals. And over here uh, we've just brought up earlier uh, today an experiment from the seafloor that we've left down for a year. It looks terrible, covered in things, but that's because when you leave things on the seabed for a while they get covered in animals. So you remember John was showing you with the Rex camera when we were diving. Rex is now back. Hooray, Rex is back. Safe. That's good to see. Um, <laughs> we were diving just over there looking at those sorts of animals growing live uh, on the columns of the jetties here in the marina, which is actually, turns out, it's really quite a biodiverse uh, spot. Lots of species here. So, yeah, so we're, we're, should we get back into the lab and look at some of those yeah, small animals? Or do you want to do some lab. questions? That's Let's right, get back into the lab. Back. I want to show you something really amazing. Um, oh, this is fabulous. So I, my favourite animals, sounds a bit weird, perhaps I'm a bit weird, are worms. <laughs> I love worms. Uh, everyone loves worms, right? Even Chris Little, who's a senior lecturer from the University of Leeds, is excited by worms. Chris, what is this? This is a uh, common name as an owl worm. And it's, uh, its Latin name is Stenapsis. I've never actually seen them before, so I was very intrigued when we fished them out of the mud earlier on today, but they're quite amazing looking little animals. He does so, look like a little owl, doesn't it actually? Like he's got two little eyes at the top and little hairy little heads. Eyes, little yeah. hairs. Oh, he's very cute. Yeah, so actually these are segmented worms, a little bit related to earthworms that you'll find in your back garden. Uh, they're called polychaetes, which means many hairs. This is perhaps not the best example to show why they're called that, but you can see, perhaps Gary, if you just come up close, maybe you can see these hairs poking out the side here, probably you can actually on the screen, it should be I quite good. I might zoom it. A bit so of zoom there, zoom. Chris. Yeah, there we go. Oh, he's, he's moving around. We'll show you how small he is in a moment. So that sieving that we were doing outside uh, was recovering. We recovered quite a few of these, maybe 20 or 30 specimens. And you can see the many. So there's sorts of segments. So segmented worm uh, in the group polychaetes. There are about 10,000 species known wow. globally. Um, from And they live almost exclusively in the oceans. So there are a few that live in freshwater rivers and well, not not that far up rivers but a little bit far up rivers so those are really amazing and that that's a really good example of the sort of things we know less about because these tiny animals that could maybe uh, uh, we could just have a look down here so you can see just how small he is we're looking at we're actually that's that shot you had before was down a microscope a really nice expensive microscope with a beautiful image just would fit on the end of my fingernail uh, really amazing so what was the species name sternaspis uh, we need to find... Regan, what was the species Regan, name? So Regan is doing a, a master's project on these. Can you remember the okay. species name? Uh, these we think are Sternaspis scutata. Sternaspis scutata. You can Fantastic. tell the difference uh, between different species um, by the shape of this shield here. So this particular species, they have a very kind of curvy, kind of like a stretched out M. So, so they're not actually so eyes? Uh, no, 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 this is actually the back end That's of right. the animal. Oh, wow. That's his right. bottom. That ah. bottom's, that bottom's Someone looking at a worm's there. bottom. Worm's oh, bottom. I'm not keen on that, I'm sorry. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so Doesn't get better than that. Upside down on birds. So it's heads in there. 
Um, but at the moment you can't actually see its head because it can retract its whole half of its body into itself. So its head is actually pulled all the way back in itself. So they curl up into a little fantastic. Bit of like a yeah. hedgehog. Yes. That, yeah. <laughs> that's that's fantastic. Thanks, Regan. So do we want to do some questions or are we going uh Yeah, we'll do some questions. We'll just head back into the to the Rex control room for the follow, questions. Well let's so let's get back into the Rex control room, yeah. So that's the lab where we look at small animals under the microscope and we actually think just on these last few trips that we've been down here we found species new to science from this area. So the, the ship just took a slight roll then so that's why I almost fell over. <laughs> Careful not to fall over. Excellent. So what I'm going to do first of all is we have a huge number of um, schools joining us today. I think we've added up, there's probably over a thousand students watching across Cornwall and Plymouth today. So we're very excited. So thank you for tuning in. And um, because we're so happy you've tuned in, we're going to read out a huge list of schools and do a shout out to all of you. So our first shout out is to the three classes watching at Trevigless Community College in Newquay. I think all of the year eight classes are watching with Miss Garrett, Miss Baker and Mr Dawes. So nice to see you all. We've got Blackwater School and oh. I know definitely class four are watching. So there may be others, but we've just heard from class four. Um, St Ives Junior School. Hello. Uh, Camelford School. I mean, St Piran's Cross School, St Mewen School. I will say that I'm pronouncing most of these. Yes, Adrian I isn't Cornish and I am. I was not so. allowed to pronounce say any of these things <laughs> because apparently I don't know how to say the words properly. I might be saying them wrong, so sorry, <laughs> but I thought there was a better chance of me getting them you right. Just, sorry. You just told me that you knew how to pronounce them. <laughs> um, we've got Lou Primary School, St Colin Minor School, which was my old primary school. So I've got my primary school watching and my secondary school. So well done, Nuki. Good show. Uh, we've got Lerin School, Marazion School. Plymouth School of Creative Arts, that's our, our token Devon school, so nice to see you. Very local to where we are at the moment. We've got St Stephen's and Saltash School, who sent us our first lot of questions. Portreath School and Millbrook School, so too many students to even count at the moment, so we hope you're all having fun. So, back onto our questions, we've got them from St Ives Junior School, uh, which is in Cornwall, and this is from Year 6 class. Uh, when was the first version of Rex created? Oh, that's so. Uh, that's a good question. I think uh, 2012 uh, we started the, the project. Uh, so yes, uh, five years ago. Um, uh, so we had um, we had a few problems at first. It took quite a while to figure out how to deploy it safely over the side and all these sorts of things. And the biggest problem we had at the beginning was figuring out how to deal with all the cables you have in the water. Uh, when we built, when we've got the ROV, you, you tend to focus on the ROV bit and not on the cable bit. But the secret is really managing the cable. <laughs> yeah, I mean you've got two hundred meters of cable, haven't you? Yeah. Which is it's just the same as when you're if you're vacuuming your your floor uh, and the cable gets wound around oh, something and you can't reach it, and then the plug, the plug pulls out. It's all about managing the cable. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's the, that's the secret. And so since then, you've been on over 100 dives, haven't you? This is uh, 124th wow. just now, just the one that we just did with John. So yeah, we gained quite a lot of experience. We've been uh, around the world. We've been to Iceland, uh, an amazing place. We've been to dive on these hot water vents north of Iceland uh, at about 70 metres depth, so quite wow. deep. How um, hot were those vents? Uh, 72 degrees centigrade. Wow. So really at the extremes of where life can exist. Uh, what you find in those places is that little bacteria, tiny, tiny forms of life that we can't see easily uh, can actually sometimes withstand those sorts of temperatures and that does allow life to exist there and there are amazing ideas in science at the moment. Uh, in fact Chris who we were just chatting to has published a paper this year on one yes. uh, about the origins of life potentially being at those sorts of hot water events uh, in our oceans in the past. So. Something really cool that happens with the animals that live there, the tiny bacteria and microbes that Adrian was talking about, is that they can live in what we call symbiosis. So this means that they live together, two different animals, um, and it's, uh, it's good for both of the animals. And an example that you see in movies of this is um, in Finding Nemo, which I'm sure many of you have seen, when the clownfish, obviously Nemo, will live in an anemone and it has a benefit to the anemone because the clownfish wards off predators and the clownfish doesn't get stung by the anemone and he can hide from predators as well. So that's called symbiosis, when two animals get a benefit out of living together. And what we get with the microbes and bacteria is that they can live inside animals um, such as tube worms. They live in their, their guts and their bellies um, to be protected and they provide food for the animals there. 
Um, and they also have things called Yeti crabs. Um, so they're called Yeti crabs because they're bright white and really fluffy because they're covered in hairs, which are called setae. And they actually grow bacteria on their arms. And then they, we kind of call them arm farms because they then wave their arms in the air to fertilize them in the water like you do on a farm. Um, and then they, with their special mouth parts, they comb all the bacteria off. So they grow their own farms of bacteria on their arms. It would be like you having a Snickers bar on your arm and being able to comb it off and eat it. So very bizarre place in the deep sea. Yeah, amazing, it's an incredible place. So um, our Great. next questions are from Lerin Primary School. Um, I think we've answered this already, why was he called Rex? So it's the remotely operated vehicle for education and exploration. Um, how long does coral take to repair itself? Um, this varies across all different species of coral. Some grow really slowly, and particularly the ones that you find in the deeper waters, because it's cold, and it means that all of the chemical processes that go on in anyone's body um, gets much slower when you're in cold water. So the ones that you'll see um, actually would be able to um, regenerate very, very slowly. Um, and they can take hundreds of years to even grow this big in very deep waters. So um, unlike coral reefs in the tropics, which grow quite quickly. So that's why we need to really protect these from things like fishing activities um, that might hurt them um, because they take a really long time to get better. And that was from um, Rosie in Lerin Primary School, so thank you. Um, then we have, what have we got next? We're not sure which school this came from, but um, this was from, I think, Nick Bow, Bow, or with Nick definitely. Um, and it says, how does how much does Rex cost? I think it's uh, about 20, is he 20? Uh, well, it was all of the pieces, including the navigation system. So Rex, we added a lot of things and special camera, maybe about 60 to 70 thousand pounds. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I guess a kind of very expensive car would be yeah. kind of equivalent. But we prefer Rex. He's much more fun. Um, how deep can Rex go? So he can go down to, well, technically, Rex himself can go down to 300 metres, which is really, really deep um, for these waters here. Um, but because we've only got 200 metres of the yellow tether, he can only go about that deep. But if we got a longer, a longer tail for Rex, then he'd be able to go much deeper. And this is probably uh, my favourite question so, so far. So I think that this student has probably seen uh, the species identification guides I sent over earlier. Um, and they've seen the poor cod um, as a species that you see in these videos that you've watched in advance. And it says, why is the cod poor? Um, which I think is a fantastic <laughs> question, question and really good. So basically, it's because it, it's, it's a bit like a cod and people eat it, um, but it generally, um, like quite a few years ago, maybe a few decades ago, was for people that were a bit more poor and didn't have as much money because it was cheaper than eating cod, but tastes just as good. Um, so there's nothing wrong with the cod. He hasn't had a bad life. Don't worry. We're not going, oh, poor cod. Um, but really great question. Thank you for whoever that was from. So now we're on to Blackwater School, and this class is Miss Burton. Um, are there other types of lobster, says Jessica? Well, yes, there are actually. So that was a really rare one that you saw, the spiny lobster. Um, but you have another type of lobster we get here, which is called the European lobster. Uh, I think it's called Homerus gamerus, I think he's called. I'm getting a nod from John, that's good. Um, and so that one lives here as well. And those are the ones that you see on your dinner plate. Um, so they're really big and they can live like 70 years old and they can get quite aggressive and they fight with each other um, when they're breeding. So they're very, very interesting animals. And there are different species to the one that you get in America, which is called Homerus americanus. Um, so we have to make sure they don't mix because that's an invasive species. Uh, next one um, is from Elizabeth Shepherd. How does Rex work and does it have light? So I hope we answered that one a bit earlier. He does have his own lights and that's why we get these beautiful <coughs> colors when we use Rex in video. Um, as well. Um, how many sea stars live under the water? I couldn't even begin to give you an answer for that because there are so many different species um, of sea stars but what you can do is go and watch a video on our Rex YouTube channel which is called which is about ophiroid beds which are a type of sea star called brittle stars and they have very very thin legs and it looks like they're all dancing and waving their arms so in terms of seeing how many you can find in one place, 
um, that video, you can see that they're really densely packed together and all dancing. It's like they're at a disco. So you should definitely go and watch that one. We've got a great one here from St. Ives. Oh, okay. Um, with more questions coming in, which is just fantastic. Uh, how do predators know what they're eating in the dark? Oh, so that's a really interesting one. Do you want me to go for do it? that one? Yes. So there's lots of different ways um, because it's, it's not even just dark. There's completely no light. Um, and if you imagine shutting your eyes and trying to find a sandwich, imagine it's got pickle and cheese in it, that's really smelly. You'd shut your eyes and you'd be able to smell where it smell. was. And yeah. so they use things, um, different senses um, are really, really increased in animals because they can't see. So they can smell things and they can pick up what we call kind of electrical signals in the water as well. Um, and things like shark, uh, shark, sorry, they have what you call, this is a big fancy term, the ampullae of Lorenzini. And they're little bumps all around from their nose, all along around to their body. They make what you call a lateral line. And these tiny bumps can pick up tiny bits of movement and kind of electrochemical signals. As animals move around them, they can feel that there's prey near them and they pounce. And there's so, one other thing, I mean, you answered that question, Amber, probably much better than I would have done, but there is, sometimes there is some light in the deep sea, yes. and that's when you get bioluminescence. Which and is some, so cool. And some predators <laughs> uh, in very deep water will use bioluminescence, which is a very long word, but all it is is making light. So they'll have a special organ on their antennae or on their head or somewhere to create a bit of light, which will allow them to see the predators. And of course, some of the things which are being eaten also use light to actually evade predation or to encourage other things to eat the things which are attacking them. It gets very complicated. So actually, surprisingly, there is these sort of occasional flashes of, of, uh, of the light produced by animals in the deep sea. Uh, and if you look that up, uh, you, you'll see some amazing videos that people have shot uh, in very deep water, much deeper really than we would go with Rex, mm. but with our big ROVs. So yeah, really great question. Um, the next question, um, uh, what have we got? We've got, what is the favourite thing you've seen with Rex so far? Oh, yeah, so I've you've seen been on more than me. And so. I've seen that also from a couple of other schools. Uh, we had from Tre Triviglas. Yeah, uh, Triviglas, yeah. Trevi oh, yeah, almost. My yeah, school. Almost. Oh, that's, that's that your my school? school yeah. uh, fabulous. <laughs> so uh, the, the, we had that couple of times, new discovery, the biggest discoveries with Rex. I was thinking about that. I mean, we've had some exciting observations, uh, but probably Perhaps the most exciting one was really on those hydrothermal hot vents off the north coast of Iceland where for the first time we were able to dive down and see animals living in that hot water plume. Uh, and I sadly haven't put those videos on, on the YouTube channel yet, but I will do. Uh, so you should look out for that when we do. Uh, but we're hoping to get back there and actually sample some of those animals and see how they're feeding wow. in those hot water. So that, that's, a, that's a, it's a work in, in progress, probably most, our, our most exciting yet. We'll keep updating you. I'll send your teachers emails and then you can see those videos when they're put up. So again, we've got um, Blackwater School again here with Miss Burton. Uh, how did we get the idea to do this live link? Good question. That's from Bay, I think. So um, basically, we both work at the Natural History Museum in London and we do lots of events where we talk to the public when they come in and they look at the specimens in jars and the videos that we show them of these amazing places. But there's only so many people we can talk to that come through the museum. Um, and it's really far for you guys in Cornwall. So we really wanted to be able to show you the amazing science we do without you having to even get off your seat in your classroom. So we hope you're enjoying it today. Um, do starfish live in a particular area? You've studied quite a few starfish, haven't starfish, you? Starfish, well, they're, they're all over the world yeah. in almost every depth, actually. Uh, not very deep, very, not thousand, you know, not maybe deeper than seven or eight thousand metres. But they're, they're still quite deep. Um, they're one of the, you know, the, the groups of ocean species which have really spread everywhere. Um, so you'll find them right from here is the very, very deep, deepest parts of the deep sea. So there isn't really anywhere where you wouldn't find them, except in places where there's not enough oxygen or the water is. Uh, you know, not suited to them, which is rather few. Should we, should we going to go back outside for um, the last... Yeah, we can yeah. do, yeah. yeah. If we just want to move outside so you can see what's... Oh, waves ah. just hit us there. Sorry, yes. nearly fell over. Um, so yeah, we'll just, uh, we'll just pop outside um, a minute and carry on answering some questions at the same while time. We, while we go outside, we should just thank um, Mayflower Marina. Oh, what, oh. what have you got, John? Spider. Oh, oh, we've just fantastic. discovered something else in our samples. That is yeah. exciting, actually. So can you explain what that is? We should have a look. Yeah. We just, just brought up this from the, probably from the sieve samples, or is it on the, this on is the bones? on a bone. Now, you can see the leg there. Ooh. So this is called a sea spider. It's not quite the same as the spiders we get in, in our houses or in our gardens, but it's got eight legs. 
Okay, and it's very spider-like. Now it's hard to make out here because it's the same colour as the bone that it's on. Well, it's got eight legs and it's just crawling its way out there and seeing what it can find to eat uh, on this bit of bone that we left down to see what would Shall I poke it with set a... up home. Here it goes. Oh, he's just having a little oh, no. walk now. Can't really see him in there, but if you look yes. here, there's a very tiny body. Let's see how tiny he is. And, and sea oh, spiders are amazing animals. So their lungs go down into their legs mm. and part of walking is what helps them to breathe. And, and their stomachs, I believe. And their stomachs. Yes. Yeah. And the dads look after the babies yeah, in like right. a little pouch. Yeah. So they look after the babies. Fantastic. No, well, thanks, John. That's really great. And just before we, we got excited about the sea spider there, we just wanted to thank Mayflower Marina, particularly for helping us to host these live links, allowing us to do it for this beautiful spot. It's amazing just how many animals you find here in Plymouth Sound, uh, just in the centre of a, of, a, of a city, in fact. So, um, yeah, Amber, what have we got? Uh, have we got shout outs, but we're probably running out of time. Aren't we? Yeah, Slightly. we've got a little bit of time left. We'll just carry on answering some questions. We're getting so many in from you guys, so thank you. Um, we've got one that's been sent quite a lot of times. Why is the spiny lobster so rare? So I mentioned it a little bit when we were watching it earlier. You all seem quite concerned about why they're so rare now, so I'll let you we know. know uh, just after this, we're going to go out and try and find yes. some more sites for spiny lobsters just offshore, uh, which is our next thing we're going to do in a few minutes, actually. Cool, so hopefully we can put some videos up, email your teachers, and then you can watch them when hopefully we find some later today. Um, but the reason they're so rare is because, like I was saying, in, in kind of the 1970s, unfortunately these lobsters taste really, really good. Um, and so people go out and they caught them, but they kind of caught too many because they didn't understand um, how much it would um, make the population get really, really small. And so what they've done is put in marine protected areas that means that these species can um, come back and they can breed and they can lay lots of eggs and then they, um, there's lots of baby lobsters and then they grow into the bigger lobsters. So um, that's why they've come back now. And we're starting to see quite a few in the past few years. And so they're getting less rare. Um, and if you ever see them, if your parents go diving and things like that, then it would be really good if you let us know or even things like um, the Cornwall and Devon Wildlife Trust because it's really important that we know where they are so we know that we can protect them um, from being, um, you know, from the population getting too small again. So good question and hopefully if you ever see them, let everyone know. Um, how much water pressure can Rex handle and how deep can he go? So we've answered the how deep we can go. But um, how much water pressure? Well, so how does 300 that... metres worth, it's okay. 300 atmospheres of pressure. So what does that mean? 300 times the pressure at the surface. Wow. So 150 times the pressure in your car tyre. Thank you, John. Wow. 150 <laughs> times the pressure in your car tyre. So if you imagine your car tyre popped, it would make a huge bang. It's 150 times that amount of pressure. So it's really, really high pressure. Um, what are we hoping to achieve? That's a very broad question, I like that. That's from Paul Treat School, Miss Allen's class, so quite, thank quite, you. Quite a range of things. We're trying to well, connect to people, to make them aware of what's living out here in UK waters, but also to conduct these particular science experiments. So perhaps for me, personally, to find species new to science that we've never seen before. So I think that would be, oh gosh, we've got to keep going. Well, more questions. So species okay. new to science. I suppose at this them. point, um, if we don't get through any of your questions, oh, I promise I will email you the answers later. We, we do have to go to sea. Uh, yes, so I will, I will just point I'll this out. Yeah, two more <laughs> questions. So we haven't had anything from Camelford Primary yet. So this is Mr. Tooley's class. Um, how many species are there in Plymouth Sound? Now, I can't answer that one at the moment. I don't know exactly how many there are. Um, but we could probably come up with a rough idea if you would email that over. Um, several hundred. Several a hundred. Thousand. A thousand. Oh, it could be anything. <laughs> we'll let you know. Lering School. How long can Rex operate without support before the power runs out? Uh, well, uh, unlimited, uh, actually. So Rex is powered from the cable all the way down the seafloor. So as long as we have power at the top, then Rex can keep going forever. There's no batteries in Rex. It's all powered down that cable. So. Um, uh, we can stay down for as long as we want until we're all tired and want to go home. Okay, so all of the other questions, unfortunately, I'm going to have to, to answer by email, but I promise that we will reply to them all um, and we'll send them all through to you. And you might get better answers, actually, than we can think of on the spot now, so maybe you're the lucky ones. Um, <laughs> but we just wanted to say thank you so much for tuning in today. Thank you for the RV Callista, owned by the University of Southampton, for um, having this amazing research vessel for us today and being our lovely, uh, glamorous cameraman over there, Gary, so thank you. 
Thanks to the Mayflower Marina. Um, and obviously we're from the Natural History Museum in London. We hope you give us a visit one day. And any more questions, feel free to send them over. And we hope to see you for Deep Discovery 2018 next year. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you for tuning in. See you soon. Bye. Bye bye.